Hi everyone, happy Space Week. I hope you've been having a good one so far. Uh, joining me today, we have my colleagues Francis and Alan from Blackrock Castle Observatory, and we're gonna be talking all about satellites. So uh, Francis, I think some of us have probably seen satellites in the night sky and not realized it, have we? Um, almost certainly. We've got a beautiful way to tell whether that light in the sky is a satellite or not. It's all part of a project we have called Sat Detectives. So we found a lovely flowchart that says, you know, hey, did I just see a satellite? And it's really surprising that you probably, in fact, almost certainly have seen a satellite. Maybe the beautifully bright International Space Station or one of the many much fainter ones. So what I'm going to do, Rob, is I'm going to share this great image. Now, this isn't my image. I found it and I thought it really captures what we want to do. And we can see this easily linked, there we go, from our SAT Detectives page. So if you go onto spaceweek.ie, you'll find SAT Detectives, where we're asking you to tell us what you see about satellites. And if you're not sure, well, we've got a reporting form. The stop of the reporting form is, how do you identify that light in the sky? Oh, that's really handy. It is handy. So here it is up close. So first off, is it a really big light? And that lets you knock off the sun and the moon. Is it moving? A key feature of satellites, the ones that we can easily spot, is they move compared to the ground and compared to the fixed stars. Obviously, the fixed stars are slowly moving as we're turning, but you're looking for something moving across the sky. If it goes really, really quick, well, that's probably a meteor or a fireball or something else. So it's going to move slowly and steadily. If it's blinking, it's probably an airplane. If it's really bright with an astronaut at the window, that's the International Space Station. <laughs> and other than that, you've probably found a satellite. Now, I went looking for satellites as part of the SAT detectives. You can see a lot of them. Just take a little bit of time to look. That's really cool. Um, I guess, you know, for, for some of us, that's going to be exciting to look into the night sky and suddenly see this little dot going you know, over our heads and realizing that's something that's out in space. But I, I know for astronomers, it can become an issue, um, particularly with what these so-called mega constellations where many, many, many satellites are put up all at once. So Al, we've got a big old telescope up on the roof of the castle. Um, have you noticed any satellites passing in front of her yet? Or you know, how bad do you think this problem will need to be before it will start affecting us? Yeah, it, it can be um, a particular problem for us. Uh, yes, I have actually seen a few satellites coming across my field of view on the telescope here at Blackrock Castle. Um, it, it, when it comes to mega constellations, one of the big issues is as, as they're moving across the image, they're, they're harder to differentiate uh, from the likes of, of asteroids that are very far out. Um, they move kind of similar pace across, um, across your image. So if you're trying to do asteroid hunting, for example, it can become a bit of an issue. Um, if you're trying to do wide field survey type work, it can be very problematic. That's where you get- Here's the image. That's where you get- <laughs> a lot of streaks across your sky. Now, these streaks that you can see here are, are like hundreds of images taken and put together. So you don't see all of the streaks in one go, but they can have a net effect of creating in a wide field image. Don't forget, when you're doing wide field imaging, you want to look as much of the sky as you can. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of that type of astronomy work is, is when you're trying to find supernovae um, and, and new areas like that. It becomes less impactful when you're looking at very small areas of the sky. So if you're looking at quasars or supermassive black holes, things like that, which are very small in the night sky, um, then it's not so much of an issue. But certainly if you're doing wide field uh, work, it is very problematic. Um, so, you know, a lot of uh, what's called the catalogs, so this, this, the, the nighttime catalogs that a lot of astronomers use, they're all wide field and they help you identify where you're looking in the night sky. Now they can all be very impacted uh, with, with mega constellations to the point of actually causing problems with, with telescopes pointing properly. Um, so it, it can be a problem for astronomers, absolutely. Wow, that's, I hadn't realized the, the effect was quite that bad. Um, have we managed to like start mitigating the problem in any way? 
Uh, from an astronomy point of view, there are some techniques we can use um, because because the constellations, because the low Earth orbit in particular, um, the ones that are slightly further out are less of a problem. It's the it's the it's the newer constellations uh, that we're putting up are, are the big problem. Um, because of the orbital paths of them, we kind of have a rough idea of where they're going to be and when they're going to be there. So we, we can come up with new observing plans to try and eliminate them in our field. But oh, Sorry, Alan, that sounds like, I'm very sorry, I'm going to have a big, huge mess in front of your telescope. You work around me. It is. <laughs> it is. Um, and and that, that is one of the, one of the issues. I mean, you're, you're dealing with a very big industry here. Um, and you know some they don't always have um, the attitude of looking out being as important as what the nature of the satellite itself is doing to help people. So there is that trade-off. You know, satellites themselves do perform a, a very important function. Um, from an astronomy point of view, they can however cause problems. Are there mitigating issues? Are, are, are people trying to work around this? Absolutely. Uh, Starlink have promised to try and come up with a new technique of, of darkening their system um, so that it doesn't reflect as much sunlight. That will partially solve the problem, but it won't completely solve the problem because they're not the only ones doing it. Uh, they're not the only ones launching satellites. Um, so they, they'll, they'll only come up with a, with a partial solution. We're still gonna have problems. We do also have other software techniques where we can take, it, take the effect of the satellite out of the image, but again, you're kind of solving the problem after it's already broken in the first place. You really don't want it there in the first place. Right. Uh, that's the ideal scenario. But to be to, to answer your question, Rob, yes and no. Yes, people are <laughs> trying to solve the problem. The reality is it's going to be a very, very difficult problem to solve completely. Yeah. See, I mean, I think we, we have, you know, we're not against satellites here. We're not like we're observe, you know, we're an observatory. We don't want satellites. We just want to see night skies. We accept that, that they're important and we need them. But I mean, is there a case to be said that we're overdoing it? I mean, is, is there more supply than actually well, meet the needs of the earth? Or is it a case of we need the competition to keep well, the price Rob, low? Let me, let me turn this back on you. So right now, there are currently five mega constellations. The mega constellations means multiple satellites that work together. Generally, a lot of them are providing internet. So they're, they're broadcasting, they're deliberately covering lots of the planet and you're getting your internet from them. That's one way to get internet in, in areas that other ways don't work. So currently there's five with operationally just less than 3000 of satellites that are currently working in these constellations. There's planning for another 16. So how many satellites do you think that's gonna give us? We got five with 3000 and there's another 16 coming. Okay, uh, from your tone, I'm, I'm suspecting it's going to be high, so I'm going to guess 65,000. Okay, uh, try 430,000. Oh my god. So whatever you think we're seeing now, it's planned to be way, way more. It's a... That seems... That seems like... <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the number How will you be able to tell like in the night? 400,000. Like in the past, the first satellite was launched way back in the 50s. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've had over 60 years of satellites. There's as many satellites planned to be launched in the next three years as there have ever been in 60 years. That is a lot to get your head around. I mean, but like this surely, apart from like for us, you know, struggling to see things in the night sky, that this has got to be, you know, leading to other problems such as, you know, space junk. And I know that we haven't properly addressed that yet. I mean, yeah. does, does this feel wise? I mean, do, do you guys have reservations about sending that many satellites up? Well, the, there, there are a number of, uh, Starlink is actually one of them, uh, one of the, the main propagators of this uh, companies who are putting together kind of a hub of people who look at uh, anti-collision systems, for example, um, and that is because, yeah, there is going to be a lot of space junk uh, up there. There are there are even satellites who are launched that are launching that are going to be there specifically to collect other satellites. 
So uh, that's how much junk they're actually going to be putting up there. Um, so it, it's going to be, it is going to be a problem just in terms of its its operations and its uh, its its space within there. Though. Don't forget, when it comes when it comes to Leo um, satellite systems, they do vary wildly in in their height, in their altitude compared to to the sur surface of the Earth. So and, you know they're they're not all on one plane. There's there, there's hundreds of miles between the bottom yeah. and the top there. Yeah. Uh, so the, there is still a, a large window for for a yeah. lot of satellites to fit in. Yeah, and of course, you know, the, the low Earth orbit, the LEO, um, the International Space Station is about 400 kilometers up. It's, that's a fairly low orbit, yep. you know, mm. the, the communication satellites that are used for your satellite TV, those are much further away in a very precise orbit over the equator. Those guys go around with the same speed as the Earth. So you've got these kind of remote, distant ones, and you've got much closer. But that low orbit, Near the Earth, they're zipping around. They're the ones I see zipping across the sky. And, you know, the space station is the most well-known of those. And there are some wonderful passes of the space station going from west to east. And you look up and go, yep, there's astronauts aboard that one. Very bright, very dominant in the sky. The other ones aren't as bright. When they're first launched, they often appear very bright. There's some wonderful footage kicking around of a Starlink, they call it a train, where the satellites have been launched together and they're going to be spreading out into their final orbit. But if you see the train go over, it's satellite, 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 satellite. And it looks like a UFO. Something is towing something else. Really remarkable, unmistakable when they're in their launch. And of course, some of these satellites fail. Down they come. And again, space debris is a huge issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there is, they, they, so they're trying to keep as many of the satellites in a non-polar orbit. Thus far, they've been reasonably successful uh, of, of doing that, which so means they're, they're kind of going equatorial-based. Mm -hmm. As opposed yeah. to... <laughs> as we based. demonstrate satellites uh, with our hands, yes. <laughs> but that, that will only suffice for a certain period of time. They're, they're gradually expanding towards the poles um, in, in fact, even recently, Musk, um, Elon Musk and Starlink uh, managed to get um, satellite communications to the South Pole, I believe. Uh, so, you know, they are breaching the poles. And a lot of the space stations, sorry, space ports. So, for example, uh, another company that, that fly out of uh, New Zealand, uh, they, they're obviously, they go around and actually come over Ireland first. Um, and before they start their, their orbital periods, but they're very polar and they, more and more of that will start to happen. Um, just gives you, it's more efficient in terms of fuel yeah. and whatnot. So, well, I suppose what's interesting is like I said at the start, if I see a satellite right now, it's, you know, it's becoming more common, but it's still rare enough that it's still kind of neat. You know, I'm like, oh, that's cool. But like, have we got any feeling for how other people feel about this? This feels like, you know, globally, you know, one country or one company could send up hundreds of thousands of satellites, but we're all going to see the impact of it. Do we have any kind of feel for how people feel about what their night sky might end up looking like? Or is that part of the, the satellite detectives? Um, that that really is, is what we're trying to find out from people. Are satellites impacting view of the night sky? And do you care? Is this something that it's cool that humans can put objects in space that reflect light for us to see them? Meaning that the night sky we see is gonna be changing. That's, that's the bit that catches it for me, that the night sky I'm used to seeing, I'm gonna get these streaks of light across it. I get the astronomers are concerned and worried and are getting additional light where they're not expecting light. It's making finding and studying astronomical objects harder. And the International Astronomical Union has a center for the preservation of a dark and quiet sky. It's something that the IAU is actively concerned about. I'm kind of more interested in what people feel mm -hmm. about this. Are you willing to trade a view of the stars, a view of the not the satellite constellations, but the actual constellations for better internet or better GPS or a remote car that can drive itself because its GPS is accurate enough that it knows where it is to within a meter. Mm. Right now, your GPS doesn't do that. So you know, self-driving cars aren't really an option, but 
would you be willing to forego those possible future benefits for a clear and quiet and dark night sky? And Rob, I would have said before I started looking that there's hardly any satellites up there. Mm -hmm. I have been looking this summer. Every clear night I've gone out into the summer and into the autumn. And I've not seen satellites twice, and I've seen satellites the other 15 times I've been out there. Wow. And we want mm. to get information from everybody. We want you to report on spaceweek.ie, SAP detectives, what have you seen? We're looking at developing an app, but we need to have an idea of the baseline that we have now. So we do have a pretty straightforward reporting form, and I'm just going to share my screen again to have a look at that. So our satellite, oops, I've got a move to catch my, there we go. So our satellite observation form that we have here, you know, are you able to see? We asked the first question, did you see any satellites? And we have that flow chart. And you might've seen a meteor, all right? Satellite generally tends to be slowly, steadily moving across the sky. A meteor might be a little faster, might flare out. It's just kind of a more of a zip. Mm -hmm. And a satellite is a slow and steady, but we're interested in both. Tell us what you saw. Yes, mm -hmm. no, not sure. We don't mind. We're not expecting you to be an expert. Then give us some information about when you saw it. What day were you looking? What was the sky like? Cloudy or clear? Whereabouts were you? We're only asking, are you in a village, in the center of a town, out in the countryside? Give us an idea of how dark the sky is and then tell us the county. And I suspect that we'll get a lot of observations from people in dark skies areas, those beautiful areas around Ireland where there isn't much light pollution. Are those the people who are more concerned? Maybe if you're in a city, it's nice to see the International Space Station. It's bright enough to be seen by city lights. Mm. And you've never really noticed another satellite. So maybe this might encourage more people to go and find a nice dark sky, find a beautiful area where they can see what's out there. That's very cool. So uh, I guess uh, before we hear from everybody else and what they think, I'm, I'm curious what you guys feel about it. Like, do, do you feel like it's a, a good trade off or do you think that you would like to see a little bit more regulation or temper our ambitions regarding satellites a little bit? Um, as an astronomer, I would most definitely like to see more regulation. Um, I, 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 I certainly am pro satellite. Um, I do think they offer uh, us an, an awful lot um, and that can actually be beneficial to astronomy um, by the way in terms of communication because it allows us to communicate with quite remote sites um, because you know when you're doing uh, uh, observations using a telescope you, you do need access to the internet um, yeah. so it, it allows us to actually get to remote sites to do pretty cool things with astronomy but I would like to see it more regulated rather than the current model which is seems very unregulated. In fact, Starlink are mandated to actually put up a minimum number of satellites by the American government. Um, mm -hmm. So, it, uh, and that's in the tens of thousands. So they have to do that or else they have to take the rest of them down again. So, wow. um, so yeah. you know, I would like to see more to get regulation internationally uh, because there are a lot of competing um, private and public sectors um, and it, it's just, it's very unregulated at the moment, which is definitely a concern. Yeah. And I've got to say, I've got, I've got a cautious concern. I do understand there are benefits to be had from these, but there are also other ways to provide these benefits. Absolutely. And the idea that you can launch 400,000 satellites, which will absolutely impact our ability to understand our universe. There's got to be a number lower than 400,000. I mean, the difference from the 3,000 that we have now and the 400,000 that are coming, there's got to be another way to do this. Yeah. And I mean, beyond the visual, I'm guessing there's also potential for uh, obstructing our capacity to even leave the planet if the space debris problem became too bad. Well, your space debris is a problem. Also, mm -hmm. the visible light is radio as well. The radio sources, these are broadcasting they're not shining light on the planet they're giving radio to the, the planet yeah. radio waves so you have radio sources as well 
So there really is a lot for, for everybody to consider. Okay, Francis, Alan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, everybody at home who's watching, if you're interested in uh, completing that form, I'm gonna post the link in the description below. Uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you're having a great space week. Uh, that's all for now. Bye-bye.